Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of neurophysiology, and this is recording part three. The brain has blood flow supplied by two carotid and two vertebral arteries. This image shows the two carotid arteries anteriorly, the two vertebral arteries posteriorly, and they come together to form this structure known as the circle of Willis. Normal cerebral blood flow is approximately 50 to 65 milliliters per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. Notice that even though the brain is only 2% of body weight, it gets 15% of cardiac output. Cerebral perfusion pressure can be calculated as mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. And this describes the actual pressure of arterial blood flow perfusing the brain. Flow to the brain is affected by carbon dioxide, oxygen, and hydrogen ion concentration. Carbon dioxide is converted to hydrogen ion, and this leads to dilation of cerebral blood vessels. In fact, cerebral blood flow increases by about one milliliter per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute for every one millimeter of mercury increase in PCO2. This effect is reduced during general anesthesia. But nevertheless, when we are doing neurosurgery, we try to avoid increases in PCO2 in order to avoid increases in cerebral blood flow, which could lead to a swollen brain. Now over time, the pH of cerebral spinal fluid will return back to normal, even though you've allowed the PCO2 to climb up. This is because bicarbonate ions will be transported into the CSF in order to buffer the acidity. So as CO2 is converted to hydrogen ion, leading to dilation of cerebral blood vessels and increased cerebral blood flow, over time, if CO2 is maintained, the pH will return back to normal. So this means that if you decide to hyperventilate a patient in order to drop their PCO2 in order to decrease cerebral blood flow, that effect only lasts for about six hours at which point the pH of the brain is buffered and cerebral blood flow has returned to baseline. This also means that when you return back to normal ventilation and normal PCO2, there will actually be a compensatory increase in cerebral blood flow. We have some diagrams to demonstrate that. Here we see a cerebral uh, blood vessel. The pH is 7.4, extracellular pH is 7.28, and this is normal. Now we create hyperventilation, which creates alkalosis. The pH is 7.57 here. The PCO2 is 25, down from 40. As a result, the tissue that is uh, supplied by this artery also becomes more alkalotic, and the PCO2 goes down here. Next, after 6 to 12 hours of hyperventilation, the pH has dropped some. The PCO2 is still the same, though. You can see that the constricted blood vessel has started to dilate again. And the extracellular tissue here has also dropped its pH, even though the PCO2 remains at 30. So we have lost most of the effect of our acute hyperventilation. And in the chronic condition, the arterial is back to its normal size. Therefore, we have normal blood flow to the brain but we're still hyperventilating this patient with a PCO2 of 25. So now what happens when we go back to normal ventilation? Well, compared to the new baseline of this brain, what you call normal ventilation is actually hypoventilation. And so these cerebral blood vessels dilate in order to try to return back to baseline. And here's a diagram that shows a similar idea. Here we've started hyperventilating a patient, so the PCO2 comes down, the pH of the CSF goes up, and cerebral blood flow has also gone down, which will make our neurosurgeons happy. But by about six hours, the pH has started to come back to baseline. The cerebral blood flow has come back towards baseline, even though we're still maintaining this new low PCO2. When we return PCO2 back to baseline, 
we get this compensatory increase in cerebral blood flow higher than at baseline and decrease in CSF pH. The cerebral metabolic rate is the rate of oxygen use. We call this CMRO2. It's about three and a half milliliters of oxygen per minute per 100 grams of brain tissue. Hypothermia and anesthesia will decrease cerebral metabolic rate and it will be increased by activity, temperature, and seizure activity. Local areas of the brain can change their blood flow based on the need. It can change by as much as 150% within just a few seconds if those neurons become needed for making a fist or reading or because of seizure activity in those cells. This is called CBF-CMRO2 coupling the relationship between cerebral blood flow and cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. Now, at low levels of volatile anesthetic agents, cerebral blood flow is not affected too much by vasodilation, right? We know that our anesthetics are vasodilators, but the brain seems to maintain normal cerebral blood flow. But as we increase the concentration of volatile anesthetic, above, let's say, about somewhere between 0.6 and 1 mac, depending on the agent, we start to get direct cerebral vasodilation due to the agent, regardless of what cerebral metabolic oxygen consumption is. We call this CBF-CMRO2 uncoupling. And now we get increased cerebral blood flow, despite the fact that our anesthetics are depressing CMRO2 because of the anesthetic. So this is why, for neurosurgery, we try to use less than half MAC of volatile agent in order to keep cerebral blood flow diminished and avoid this cerebral vasodilation. Most of the IV anesthetic agents, like propofol, etomidate, and barbiturates, as well as opioids, are cerebral vasoconstrictors. Now that's assuming that the patient doesn't hypoventilate. If I take a patient in pre-op and give them a lot of opioids, it may be true that it will cause cerebral vasoconstriction, but it will also make them stop breathing or hypoventilate. Hypoventilation makes your CO2 go up, and as we saw, when your CO2 goes up, you have cerebral vasodilation. So assuming that you don't let patients hypoventilate, most of these IV drugs are actually cerebral vasoconstrictors, which makes them preferable for neurosurgical procedures. Ketamine is unique. It's a cerebral vasodilator and is not usually used in neurological anesthesia. Neurons need a constant supply of oxygen. Unlike, say, muscle cells, which can do anaerobic metabolism, neurons can only do anaerobic metabolism for a couple seconds. Your muscles could make it up to 30 minutes without oxygen. This is why lack of oxygen or blood flow to the brain leads to unconsciousness within just a few seconds. Brain cells also require glucose for constant metabolic activity, and very little glucose is stored in those neurons. So blood supply is needed to supply glucose to the neurons. But, interestingly, insulin is not required to transport glucose into neurons, which makes them different from most other cells in the body. We have talked about autoregulation before. The idea that blood flow to some organs does not change very much, even if there's a large fluctuation in arterial blood pressure. In the brain, this occurs in the range of about 60 to 140 millimeters of mercury. That's talking about MAP, mean arterial pressure. Some people like to use cerebral perfusion pressure instead when describing cerebral autoregulation. The curve shifts to the right in patients who are chronically hypertensive. So whereas a regular patient may have similar cerebral blood flow, whether their MAP is 150 or 60, 60 might be far too low for a chronic hypertensive, and in that patient, they've fallen off the lower end of the curve and are hypoperfusing their brain. Going back to the top curve here, this solid blue line is the normal autoregulation curve. The curve becomes flattened which means we lose autoregulation as the concentration of anesthetic agents rises. And that is demonstrated by the dotted blue line. So what we see here is very interesting. Under anesthesia, 
Well, let's back up. Without anesthesia, whether blood pressure is low or high, the brain is getting a constant amount of cerebral blood flow. But when we add anesthesia and lose autoregulation, at low blood pressures, the brain is hypoperfused. And at high blood pressures, the brain is hyperperfused. Now we'll talk about some uh, cerebral vascular disease. And the first is a stroke, also called a CVA, which stands for cerebral vascular accident. There are two kinds of stroke. Ischemic strokes block blood flow to the brain. Usually it's an atherosclerotic plaque, which ruptures and becomes a blood clot. Patients can have TIAs, a transient ischemic attack, which is like a mini stroke. That would be a stroke that resolves within 24 hours. Risk factors for cerebrovascular disease include hypertension, smoking, diabetes, alcohol consumption, and hyperlipidemia. The first step when a patient presents with a stroke is to make sure it's not a bleed, make sure it's not a hemorrhagic stroke. Usually that's done by CT scan. Assuming it's not a hemorrhagic stroke, we need to treat the clot. We give aspirin, we may give IV infusion of thrombolytic drugs, or even direct infusion of those drugs through angiography. Surgical decompression of the skull may be necessary in order to decrease intracranial pressure. When patients have ischemia to the brain, the normal body response is hypertension in order to try and increase perfusion to the diseased brain. So these patients may have out of control blood pressure and they may need antihypertensives. We should also control hyperglycemia. And some people have looked at deliberate hypothermia in order to protect the brain tissue by decreasing CMRO2. A hemorrhagic stroke occurs when a blood vessel ruptures. Often this is due to hypertensive patients who have chronic stress on their cerebral vasculature. A subarachnoid hemorrhage usually occurs due, due to a ruptured aneurysm. Risk factors include hypertension, polycystic kidney disease, familial aneurysms, smoking, and cocaine use. Patients who make it to the hospital often describe that they had the worst headache of their life as well as photophobia, stiff neck, and decreased consciousness. EKG changes are commonly seen in intracranial bleeds, including ST depression or T-wave inversion. If it's a ruptured aneurysm, it's often treated surgically, either by doing a craniotomy and clipping the aneurysm, or in an intravascular, an endovascular technique, and dropping glue or coils into the aneurysm in order to block blood flow to that uh, damaged part of vasculature. Other things that can occur in patients who've had a hemorrhagic stroke include seizures and increased ICP. They may subsequently develop cerebral artery vasospasm, and we've discussed before that might be due to the fact that hemoglobin binds nitric oxide. And so now they have a deficiency of nitric oxide, which normally vasodilates, and as a result, they may have vasospasm. The classic treatment for a hemorrhagic stroke is triple H therapy, hypertension, hypervolemia, and hemodilution in order to maximize blood flow to the brain and prevent vasospasm. Calcium channel blockers like nimodipine may also help reduce risk of vasospasm, and this risk actually persists for up to three weeks after the hemorrhage. As you can imagine, a cerebral artery vasospasm is like an ischemic stroke and can be catastrophic. There are two main kinds of hematomas or collections of blood that can occur in the brain and you should be very clear on how to distinguish them. They are the epidural hematoma and the subdural hematoma. A subdural hematoma is typically crescent-shaped. It occurs when there is rupture of the small bridging veins that exist between the dura and the arachnoid layers. This injury commonly occurs due to a deceleration injury or a blunt force injury. As blood accumulates, Intracranial pressure will increase, a midline shift can occur, and cerebral blood flow will decrease. 
Subdural hematomas typically need to be surgically evacuated. An epidural hematoma typically is described as lens-shaped when seen on imaging. It occurs when there is disruption of the meningeal artery or other cranial vessels that are between the skull and the dura. And this hematoma is often associated with skull fracture. Patients may have a lucid interval where they are first unconscious at the time of the injury, then become conscious, and then subsequently lose consciousness again. Small epidural hematomas can actually be observed, while larger hematomas typically require surgical evacuation. We'll stop here with this recording. Please contact me with any questions.